I think what we'll do now is we will go ahead and uh, ask another poll question. How often do you use patient-specific instrumentation for your shoulder arthroplasty? And uh, if we can get the audience to do that, I think it'd be great to get uh, Boncha's uh, view on this, who will be coming up uh, next. Boncha, how often in your practice do you use first planning software and then go ahead and get a guide with patient-specific in, you know, instrumentation, Boncha? Thank you, John. So um, I use it for the complicated patients like the revision surgery or the fracture sequelae, right? I didn't use it routinely. But for the patient that I'm, I have problem about the anatomy or deformities, I need this patient-specific instrumentations. Because you know, the, we have very narrow margin of error, especially the, uh, our Asian people, we have very small grinoid, so you cannot miss. So PSI, I think that that is a look. Yeah, Bancha, I agree with you. You know, what I've noticed is one of the nice things about the one planner is there's auto segmentation, but it's always checked by an engineer, the quality. Yeah. Some of the programs that are out there that are auto segmentation only can be wrong. Right. We've shown that almost 50% of the time that can occur. So one of the nice things with the one planner with Zimmer Biomet, you have that quality and assurance. And there, there are the results. We can see there the majority of people don't use patient specific yeah. Again, I think we'll learn more about this during the, the uh, these talks, and I know I'm excited to hear your talk about yeah. reverse shoulder arthroplasty and how to achieve reproducible results. Thank Answer, you. Please. Thank you, John. I'm Dr. Bansha Chunchuchit from Thambasad, University of Thailand. So thank you for the invitation. Today I'm talking about the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, how to achieve the reproducible results. So we need to, to concern four things, right? Uh, number one is the patient selection. This is quite important. You need to stick to the indications. Number two is a pre-op planning, okay? Number three is a, you need to know the design, the implant design, and also the surgical techniques. I think number three is a very important. And the number four is a post-operative rehabilitation. So the patient selection, you need to stick to the indications. So now the indication for the reverse is extending more and more, right? Like you have massive, Illipalibal cuff, cuff tear atrophy, three, four part fractures, right? And fracture sequelae. Nowadays, it's becoming more and more, more and more common, especially sometimes in the very young patients. And type two, uh, B2 green oil or revision surgery, okay? So in my practice nowadays, I do more reverse comparing to anatomic shoulder because the indication is extending more and more. And three complications that we need to concern. The most common is the scapular notching, instability, and also the infection. So if you stick to these four things, you have less complication, right? So uh, the ideal patients for reverse is should be, number one, should be old, old enough, advanced age, irreparable cuff, narrow HI, severe fatty infiltration is important. You need to look for the third minor. And last thing is the pseudopalysis. So these three patients, they have same shoulder weakness, right? But the record is different. The first patient have calf tear problem. The second patient have cervical spine problem. The third patient is the Baker plexus problem. So you need to consider and do not miss. Because if you operate in the patient that have nerve problem, you have problem, you have complication. So very important, you need to do the clinical assessment, check the posterior deltoid, check the less minor, check cervical spine, and also the brachial plexus, right? So this patient is my fault. This long time ago when I was young, he has a fracture dislocation of the shoulder. So I did the reverse shoulder arthroplasty for him. So X-ray look nice, but just one month later, the patient have dislocation because he has weak deltoid and the patient have a nerve injury. So. This, uh, I'm very sorry about that, okay? So you need to stick to the indications. So poor outcome will be in the young patients will have good shoulder function. So try to avoid that in the young patient. But sometimes we cannot avoid, like you have fracture sequelae or uh, revision surgery. And we saw if the young patients is not so good comparing to the old because um, the shoulder score is less comparing to the patient that older than, older than 55. So for the pre-op planning, yeah, this is our like routine X-ray, uh, CT scan, sometimes MRI, right? And sometimes in revision case of fracture sequelae, you need patient-specific instrumentation. Uh, in case that you have doubt, you need to check the cervical spine, MRI, or EMG also, right? 
so do not miss like massive cuff tear irreparable cuff tear i need to have uh x-ray right ap x-ray view and also mri especially you need to look at your tallest minor because this is the very important muscles that can make you have abduction external rotation so for the cut tail travesty, if they have no green eye problem, I just have X-ray and also MRI. Whenever the patient have the green eye problem, I will use MR, uh, CT scan also. Also arthritis, yeah, if we, uh, you need all investigation because in also arthritis, uh, you need to check the quality of the rotator cuff. Sometimes the patient have the arthritis, primary also arthritis, but poor cuff quality. And CT scan will detect the rectal version of the green eye. So in osteoarthritis, you need to investigation. Okay, X-ray, MRI, and CT scan, right? Proximal humerus, most of the time, I just need X-ray and also the CT scan to see the fracture morphologies, right? EMG sometimes is important because um, the examination is unclear and the patient has so much pain. So this is a, a patient, she's my friend's mother, just a chronic uh, shoulder pain. So I look at the films. This is like massive, irreparable with arthritic change, right? So I do reverse for her. So after surgery, x-ray look weird, right? So I saw that the patient have this scapula stress fracture, the scapula spine. So I look back at the pre-op. You see that the patient have this stress fracture, the scapula. So that's my fault. I didn't see the x-ray properly. So don't forget to look at the x-ray properly. So this patient, I'm very sorry. So one year after that, the displacement is small and the cravical AC joint dislocation because the prosthesis move upward and the patient start to have the uh, notching, right? So I'm very sorry about that. So this is um, her function. I discussed with my friend, function is not too bad. So I cross follow up her now, right? So next patient is about osteoarthritis. So as I tell you, also try this, when you do, when you try to do anatomic shoulder replacement like arches, yeah, you need to make sure that the patient have good bone quality, especially the retro version of the green oil, should not more than 15 degree, right? And you ha should have good rotator cuff muscles and function, right? If you have bad bone qualities, like you have retro version or the poor uh, cuff quality, yeah, better do reverse. This article mentioned about the uh, results of the reverse in osteoarthritis. So the two-year follow-up is pretty good, excellent results. So nowadays we have more and more anatomic, uh, we have more and more reverse shoulder arthroplasty in primary osteoarthritis. If they have poor cuff quality and severe electroversion of the green oil. In the rheumatoid arthritis, you have to be very careful because rheumatoid always happen in the young, right? And also the bone is soft, yeah? So like this patient, she uh, have the rheumatoid arthritis, I do reverse for her. Four months later, she have motorcycle accident. So you see that there's fracture of the green oil and also broken of the screw. So I get in, I revise, put the bone graft from the eyelid crest, fix her again. So she's happy, but she's active. She ride the motorcycle every day. So one and a half year later, she's come back with a fracture of the green oil again. So this is the third operation. So this time I think we need patient specific instrumentation because yeah, this is should this should be the last operation for her. So I did the patient specific instrumentation and we do the surgery in the sawbone first. We do a 3D painting and do surgery in sawbone. So that's good because you can like yeah, rehearsal before you do the real surgery. There will be no surprise in the surgery. And now she's happy, right? And I told her you should stop riding the motorcycle. So patient specific instrumentation is quite useful. Like the Tom told you, especially in the patient that complicate like the um, revision surgery or fracture sequelae. So in the rheumatoid patients, yeah, it's quite challenging because I told you the bone quality is soft. Patient always always have poor cuff quality, also poor bone stock, always young patient and still active. So the result of rheumatoid is not so good comparing to the uh, primary osteoarthritis. So for an investigation, the 2D CT scan sometimes is not accurate because the original CT scan were almost never perpendicular to the scapular body. So sometimes you need this 3D CT scan and you will have the 
better orientations, right? So for the green oil, I think green oil is the most critical for the reverse shoulder toplasty. Uh, especially our Asian people, our green oil is very small, right? You have no, um, no room for the error. So like this uh, diagram show you that the posterior green oil, yeah, there's this um, danger zone. You can penetrate into the suprascapula notch, right, or spinal kinoid notch. So if you have the patient-specific instrumentation, you can solve this problem, right? So we have the navigation system and patient-specific instrumentation. For me, the navigation system, I don't like it because yeah, it's like real time and it's moving all the time. So for me, I prefer the patient-specific instrumentation. Yeah. So this is the navigation system, right? You see that? It's not easy because uh, it keeps me moving all the time. So I, I, I prefer to use the PSI, okay? So PSI, yeah, you can see that PSI, you have less uh, chance of the deviation and the accuracy is very, is very good. It's only one to two millimeter uh, degree of the deviation, right? So for the circular techniques, yeah, uh, we use the uh, bit chair position, but very careful when you do bit chair. Some trick is that you need to put the small sand back in the scapula to push the scapula like protraction. Okay, it's easier for the surgery. So I put this, you see that the small sand back, so protraction is good. If it's retracted, it's not easy. And uh, semi bit chair position, 45 degree up. And very careful, you need to prep and drape the axilla very well because most of, it, or most of the infections coming from the armpit. So use deltopectal approach. I think this controversy, deltopectal and the, the trans deltoid. But for me, I prefer deltopectal because I can approach to the green oil better. And from the literatures, they found that you have more notching if you're going from the top, right? You're going from deltopectal, you have better exposure of the green oil, but you have higher chance of the instability comparing to the uh, supralateral approach, okay? So green oil exposure is the key. I think this is important, like I just said, right? You need to have the good exposure, release the tissues. This is my step, right? Uh, I release the subscapularis, and also I use 135. 135, you have better exposure to the green oil, right? It's better than 155. And also, you have to release the inferior capsule and also the uh, dry step insertion, right? And use the optimal retractor, okay? So for the implant design, right? This is uh, important. You need to know the design of your implant, right? About the green oil component, yeah? And also the humeral component, right? So how much lateralization for the green oil? So ideally, I prefer to lateralize about 5 to 10 millimeters. And we prefer the eccentric. Yeah, we go uh, eccentric and inferior overhang about two to four millimeters, okay, for the overhanging and the inferior tilt about 10 to 15 degree. And for the size of the crinosphere, we prefer to use the bigger size, but I think the appropriate size is better. If you big, use a bigger size, you have the overstuffing and it's difficult for exposure, okay? A larger kinosphere, you have better external rotation and internal rotations, but smaller kinosphere, you have better abduction. And so this is my preferred techniques for the green oil exposure. Yeah. So for the online inlay, I think now in the market, like a simple biomet, also have the onlay because you can use the similar system. You have less bone, you remove less bone. Uh, for me, I prefer the onlay system. Uh, is um, have more lateralizations and uh, better land of motions yeah comparing to the inlay system right but you have a higher chance of the uh, acromion stress fracture for 155 135 the 135 you have less notching okay and also the 155 you have higher chance of notching a sharp angle effect so 135 you have ex better exposure also less contact pressure and also the better adduction and extension comparing to 155. This is the effect of arm lengthening of the neck sharp angle, right? 
For the hemolytroversion, this is a study from our friend Dr. Chuan O. Oh. He found that individualized the retroversion is better than fixed angle, right? The result is better comparing to the fixed angle. So I follow Chuan O. Oh. I prefer the individualized retroversion. So I prefer the native retroversion and also I prefer only system 135. So this is a conclusion of the implant design. For the subscapularis repair is controversy. Subscap repair may may better internal rotation, may less external rotation or the improve the stability. So that's controversy. So for the sub subscap repair or not is quite controversy and now there's still no conclusion. Some say that you repair the subscap, it's not subscap anymore, it's just an adductor because the center of rotation change, right? If you repair the subscap, you have more tension. Uh, if you not repair the subscap, you have less joint re reaction force, less deltoid force for abduction. So this group prefer no subscap repair because less joint reaction force and less deltoid force in abduction. Subscap repair may limit external rotation from this article. Okay, and some articles mention that repair or not repair, you have no uh, clinical outcome, no difference in clinical outcome. This paper also, a big series, they found that there's no difference in the clinical outcome in repairing subscap or not. This is another article from Juan O. He found that subscap repair, Juan O, you like subscap repair, right? He found that the stability is better in all angles of the motion, right? And this is a conclusion from the subscap right better internal rotation or not is unclear but you have some limitation external rotation but you have improved stability after the subscap repair so this is my approach for the subscap i prefer subscap repair but in neutral rotation if i cannot repair the subscap is it too much tension i will not repair it okay if i can i will repair right and for i do bicep tenodesis to the chondroid tendon like this and I prefer to use the local antibiotics. I use vancomycin powder put into the wound because this is, I learned from the spy surgeon. They, we found that this is quite useful. I have no infection at all after I use this technique. So uh, another scenario is the proximal humerus fracture. This is a, a 73 years old man. He has four part fracture, proximal humerus. So we freak his uh, proximal humerus with the reverse right so the indications uh, for the repair of the tuberosity five reasons to reattach the tuberosity number one is to restore the active external rotation number two to restore the humeral length that optimal deltoid tension number three better joint stability number four reduce the la the risk of infection because you have better vascularity and number five reduce the property of the humeral implant loosening right so I always repair my tuberosity in four, three, four part fracture. So this is the Pascal Bolo way to fix the tuberosity. That's a six suture uh, technique and it's worked really well, right? They're like this patient and the result is pretty good. So it's proof that the reverse comparing to the hemiatoplasty, overall result is much better, right? Like this, if you have the hemiatoplasty, you need to do it you need the tuberosity healing. But for the reverse, even the tuberosity not heal, the patient still have good function. But if the tuberosity heal, the patient will have excellent function because they will also have a good rotation, right? So this is my article about the tulipalatai injection for the reverse patients. You can improve the chance of the tuberosity healing, right? So last scenario, this is the fracture sequelae. Um, all patients, they have fractures, proximal humerus. My fellow fixed that, is failed. So I revised that for him. Yeah, using the patient specific instrumentation and the function is pretty good. So lastly, about the post-op rehabilitations, right? So the goal is to uh, pain relief at the first stage. At the first six weeks, I treat this patient like massive calf tear. I put the patient in the abduction breast Okay, delay, delay rehabilitation. I start to do rehabilitation after six weeks. Okay, and after 12 weeks, I do the strengthening exercise. Okay, and also don't forget to train the uh, periscapular muscle and also the scapular tilt because that can improve the internal rotation of the patients. So, first step to achieve 
reproducible results. Number one, patient selection. This is very important. Number two, pre-op planning. Number three, surgical techniques and implant design. And number four, post-op rehabilitation. Thank you.